All right, how's it going? We should have sound on the video today. Yay. I was trying some teleconferencing with Izad two days ago, and I changed my microphone settings. Forgot to change them back. I thought I changed them back, but I changed the wrong thing. So we should be we should be back to happiness today. So, um, so quick run through on the ODP. Um, we talked about this in class already, right? Start off at the left subtree's root, and then while that root's pointing to something on the right, move down to the right. And when you can't move to the right anymore, just return that node's data. So that's that's the essence of finding the largest node. Um, Does it make sense that we have to include this structure statement in this file? It, it might seem like if it's in the main, we don't need it here, but in fact, we do. Or in a header file. And even though we're going to link this with main, even though eventually we're going to say something like, um, GCC dash O main largest dot C main dot O main dot O doesn't know anything about what a struct node is. Okay, that information is kind of gone. Yeah. What if we use main dot C? And even if we use main dot C When it's compiling main.c, it'll know what a struct node is. But when it's compiling largest.c, it's not going to peek in here and figure out what a struct node is. So does that mean once we play simple file, we are always include headers? You're always going to want to, for example, define the structure in a file where you're using the structure. And that's either because you explicitly put something like that, the struct node definition, or you include something that does that. What if we declare in our secret file a little bit different from our main structure? Then you get all kinds of weird stuff. So if in here I said uh, struct node left integer data, struct node right, it's not going to work well. Because this will get compiled into a .o file. This will get compiled into a .o file. And then these get joined together into this executable. Once this is compiled, that struct statement is gone. So if this is my struct statement and I want to access something root arrow left down here in the beginning of my function, that's been translated into take the address that root specifies and add 12 to it. And that's what I want to set root equal to. Root arrow right might be take the address that root specifies and add 20 to it. And that's the address that I want to load into, um, into root. And the fact that this was a struct node is completely gone. So if I define my struct node left, right, and then data, now struct node left might be take the address of root and add 0 to it. Yeah? If we have a difference in node and and a super file. Uh, it compiles, however, which one has a higher priority? Will be the They're both system. gone. I mean, as output, which one has a higher priority? Uh, it's not really a priority thing. Are you talking about different structures? I mean, when we create a .o file, yeah. from me a super file, which one has a higher priority? Priority as far as what? Uh, execute to output. Which data we use as priority? It would be very complex. It's all the same data, in some sense. So, so let me give you a different example. A 
Let's see if this answers your question. So here's main.c. So I say struct node integer x integer y. Okay, and here's my function.c. And I say struct node. And I say integer y integer x. Okay, so I have different definitions of what a struct node is. So inside here, I've got, you know, struct node n. And over here, I've got a struct node n. And I say nx equals 10, ny equals 20. And now I call function with n. Okay, so here's my function. It takes a struct node n, and I say print n dot x. Okay, I would hope that it's going to print a 10 because I said n dot x equal to 10. But when this gets compiled, this becomes um, uh, well. Here's here's our node n. This says the first thing is x, so this puts a 10 in here, and this puts a 20 in here. Okay, and this gets passed to my function. Well, when my function gets compiled, what is it seeing? A struct node looks like this. It's got a y, and it's got an x. So when I print n dot x, I'm going to print a 20. And it's not that one has priority over the other per se. It's just memory. But each has its own interpretation of what these different locations in memory are. This thinks the first thing it finds is x. This thinks the first thing it finds is y. And you won't get any warnings. You won't get any errors. You won't get any hint anywhere in the compilation or the execution process that there's anything weird going on. But when it runs, you'll be talking about different pieces of your structure, basically. Does that make sense? And that's useful to go back and think about sometimes, like how does this stuff compile and, and what does it look like when it's just ones and zeros? Is that a question coming? Yeah. I had a question. Can we go back to the code? Um, so if you after the structure, um, you declare a structure, you do a type dev struct node node. Mm -hmm. Can you put node star left and node star right inside the structure, or do you have to use node after the type dev? Hmm. <coughs> so what do we want to do here? So, so type dev. Right, type dev. Uh, no, struct node node. Okay. And can you go inside the structure inside the declaration of the structure up top. Oh, up here? Yeah. No. I think it'll freak it out. Okay. It's possible it does some look ahead, but I think it'll, well, let's just find out. So. Yeah, maybe it's got to look ahead. Nope. Um, oh, no, that's okay. Unknown type node, yeah. Okay. And I don't know if it's smart enough. I mean, it's not hard to make a compiler do this, because all it's got to do is look ahead. Yeah, so that works. And then eventually it should yell at you if you don't actually tell it what a node is. Um, It's cool to know. Yeah. So uh, on, on this ODB, uh, do we need to make the new struct nodes uh, after the roots like B2B? Uh, let's see. Yeah, this. So ask, ask that again, sorry? Uh, in this, uh, do we need net new, new struct node after the, after the roots like BA1, uh, BA2 and BA3? 
uh, root equals something current uh, uh, arrow to the right side. For this, uh, no. Uh, no, the current equals root arrow to the right side. Like, like second not after the root. Not, not for this one, uh, right? Because for this one, all we're doing is we're exploring the left side of the tree. But, but we can do that or not. <coughs> Uh, if you do that here, it might not assess fully, oh. right? So, so this is this is purely an exploration. It's just go into the tree and explore it and find the biggest node on the left. So, yeah. All right. Um, let me head off some late night emails, because I've gotten some questions about this. Um, this business of, of stack mode and queue mode and how to handle this in a main program. Um, and I've talked about stateful programming a few times, so I think it's worth going through one more uh, instance of this. So you've got a program and you can put in commands like p for print or um, well that's our main command is p or you can type in a number which is basically add this number to my structure and what this does depends on whether you're in stack mode or queue mode right so you can you can make a set of statements for stack mode and make another set of statements for queue mode and try to ping between those those sets of code um, but the idea of, of state is sort of doing that in a data-driven way. So, so my suggestion has been, you know, make something like a state variable, right, as in 250 state machine kind of state variable. So make maybe an integer state and use it as a flag where zero means that you're in stack mode and one means that you're in queue mode. And so your main program, which is this forever loop, does something like read input. And if your input is, is the command P, you either want to pop from the stack or remove from the queue, right? Which one do you do? Check your state variable. So if state equals zero, pop from the stack. If your state equals one, remove from Q. Yeah? Good, yeah, so you can make your state variable a character. Uh, well, you could use ASCII codes, or you, you can just make it a character and use quote S or quote uh, Q, and that avoids you having to remember what a zero or a one is. So I would definitely do that. Um, your other option, well, I'll, go, I'll give you another option in a second along those lines. Um, so if your input is an integer, then what do you want to do if state equals zero? Push to stack. If your state equals one, insert into the queue. And so on. And then if your input is an S, set your state equal to zero and print the stack. If your input is a Q, set your state equal to one, print the Q, and so on. So, so number one, this puts all the code in one place and it lets you see what's going on based on your mode. Um, but it's, it's an instance of a more general concept, which is this, this idea of stateful programming where you have the same set of code, but it does different things in different circumstances. The set of circumstances, that's what we call the state. Okay, in a 250 state machine, it's the values in a bunch of flip-flops. Here, it's the value of a variable, or the ASCII code stored in a character. 
and we could have multiple states. We could have a stack mode, we could have a queue mode, we could have a debug mode, where every time that you do something, it gives you lots of extra information, and so on and so forth. And yeah, this 0, 1 is, is error prone and kind of sloppy. Here's what you can do in the beginning of your program. You can use some defines. <coughs> Define stack. And doesn't matter what value you have. You could call that 17. <coughs> Define Q, uh, negative 12. Doesn't make any difference. But now what I'm going to do is initialize my state equal to stack. And I'm going to say if state equals stack or if state equals Q. And now my magic values are, are not something I have to deal with as a programmer. As long as stack and Q represent different symbols, right, I can effectively be saying if state is 0, if state is 1, but I can use these symbols stack and Q. And then it's pretty unambiguous what's going on. And then if I want more values, I can just define more values. All right, does that help? If you were looking for help. <coughs> So we're going to talk about something called AVL trees. And I don't remember what the initials stand for, but you can look them up. I can't pronounce them anyway. But I usually try. Um, so we're talking about binary search trees. So in all cases, we're going to have this property that things to the left are smaller than the root, which is smaller than things to the right. So that if we traverse this tree in order, we get our numbers in increasing order. And we had a definition of balanced, right? And it was recursive. A tree was balanced if its left and right subtrees were also balanced, and if the left and right subtrees were almost the same height. Okay, the difference in heights can be no more than one. So it's a recursive definition. And so let's, let's build a tree. Let's insert a 10. So our tree looks like this. And then let's insert a 3. So that'll come to the left. And then let's insert a 20. So that'll come to the right. And then let's insert a 40. And that'll come to the right. And it's starting to look a little lopsided. But in fact, this is still a balanced tree, something with two nodes. Because the left subtree has height minus 1, the right subtree has height 0. But if we insert uh, 30, this will no longer be balanced. And if we use the definition, we can see that this left subtree has a height of 0. This right subtree has a height of 2, right? Maximum distance from the root to any node. 0 and 2 are too far apart. So at this point, our tree is not balanced. We'd like to be able to know this without having to go through and recursively calculate the balance of the tree every time we do something. So here's the first idea. We're going to start off with an empty tree, and an empty tree is balanced. And what we're going to do every time that we add a node, we're going to see if the tree is still balanced. And we're only going to have to check close to where we inserted this node. And then if we insert a node and we find the tree is not balanced, we're going to fix the balance right then and there. So our tree is never going to be too badly unbalanced. 
So we're going to define something called a balance factor. So the balance factor of a node n equals, and it's going to be the height of n's left subtree minus the height of n's right subtree. So every node has a balance factor, and it's the height of the left subtree minus the height of the right. You can do everything we're about to do, switching this around right minus left, but then everything's going to be opposite. So unless you go to that parallel Earth that's exactly opposite us on the sun where everything's backwards, we're going to stick with left minus right. Okay, so let's look at the 30. Left subtree is null, right subtree is null. Both of those have a height of minus 1. Minus 1 minus minus 1 is 0. So the balance factor here is 0. So I'm going to put the balance factor in parentheses. The 40, left subtree is a single node, that's a height of 0. Right subtree is null, that's a height of minus 1. 0 minus minus 1 is 1. So this has a balance factor of 1. And it's telling us the tree on the left has a height that's one bigger than the tree on the right. Single node versus null. Okay, the 20, what's the balance factor here? <coughs> or any ideas how to find that? Okay, so what's what's the left subtree? It's null, right? Null, yeah. And what's the height of a null tree? It's minus one. Okay, and the right subtree is this. Minus minus one. And so what's the height of this? That's got a height of one. So the balance factor here is minus two. In other words, the left subtree is two lower than the right subtree. And you can kind of tell there's no nodes there, there's one, two nodes over there. Okay, what about the root? Left subtree is one, right is one, two, three, one minus three is minus two. And this node, null and null, this has a balance factor of zero. Before we did that insert of the 30, let's see what our tree looked like. So this had a balance factor of 0, minus 1, minus 1, and 0. So here's the thing. If all of our balance factors are 0, 1, or minus 1, the tree will be balanced. If any of them are bigger than 1 or smaller than minus 1, the tree is unbalanced. And if we insert this node right here, we can work our way up to the root until we find a node that's bigger than 1 or less than minus 1. If we get all the way up to the root and that hasn't happened, we know our tree is still balanced. But if we encounter a node that's too large or too small, that's where we've got a problem. And so our problem is somehow right around here. And that kind of feels like it makes sense, right? We've got too much stuff over here. We'd like to somehow do something to bring more stuff over to the left somewhere. All right, so this is our general approach. We're going to insert something. We're going to recalculate balance factors. And when we find something that's too big or too small, we're going to make an adjustment. And these adjustments are called rotations. And we're going to have to make either one or two rotations to restore balance. 
and so we don't need numbers in here anymore. So here's one case where we might need to make an adjustment. Suppose there was nothing over here on the left. Now we're just looking at parts of a tree. There's other stuff up here and there's other stuff down below. But just looking at this part, this is unbalanced. This is a balance factor of 0, minus 1, minus 2. And let's call this A, B, C. We could change this into something nicely balanced by here's A, B, and C by basically doing this. Bring A down on the left, make B the root, bring C down on the right. It's going to have the same search order as this, but it's going to put some stuff on the left that was on the right. So if we were to take this and change it into the following, B, A, C, right, that actually turns out to be perfectly balanced. And it's still a BST. So in that case, B would come up to the root, and A would come down to the left. So here's the general picture. I think I ripped this off from Wikipedia somewhere. I didn't draw it. Here's the general picture where we're going to calculate balance factors, and we're going to find a balance factor of either 2 or minus 2. Okay, suppose we find a balance factor of minus 2, and its child has a factor of either minus 1 or 0. That's what we call a right-right case. And we're going to make a transformation. We're going to basically rotate around the 4, which means the 3 is going to come down to the left, and the 4 is going to become the root. 4's right child is going to stay a 5. 5's children are going to be unchanged. But since 3 is going to come down and be a child of 4, we've got to do something with B. But since 3 is coming down, it's not going to have a right child, so 3 is going to adopt B on its right. So this is called the right-right case, because our imbalance is we got something to the right and something to the right. Okay, let's just see if this preserves binary search tree characteristics. So what's the search order up here? if we were to traverse this tree, we would traverse everything in A, and then we would visit the root 3, and then we traverse this subtree down here, which means visit B, traverse the root, and then traverse this subtree, which is C, 5, D. And by A, I mean whatever nodes you get when you traverse this whole subtree A. Once we make this change, What's our traversal order? Come down to the left, traverse this subtree, so this is A, 3, B. Then traverse the root 4, and then traverse this right subtree, which will be C, 5, D. Same traversal order. So it's still a binary search tree. We haven't changed the way in which we're going to visit these <coughs> nodes. But we've restored balance. This root is guaranteed to have a balance factor of 0 or 1 now. So when we insert, if we fall into this case, we make these changes. The left-left case is symmetric. So we're going to find a node with the balance factor of 2, and its child is either 1 or 0. And in that case, we do something similar, but we rotate clockwise around the 4, and we end up with this. The slightly harder case is if you find a balance factor of, say, minus 2, but its child has a positive factor. And this is called the right-left case because there's too much stuff to the right, but on the right, there's too much stuff to the left. And so we do a pair of rotations. The first thing we do is we rotate about the four to change this into that. And then we do our regular rotation for the right-right case. So it takes a pair of rotations. And the left-right case, 
balance of two and then a negative factor on its child. And we rotate uh, counterclockwise about the four to turn this into the left left case and then we adjust that to be balanced. So let's let's do some of these and then I'm going to let you do some of these. So let's just go totally pathological. Let's just start inserting consecutive numbers. And we know that when we do this, we're going to get basically a big long list. It's a tree that looks like a list. So let's just insert um, consecutive integers and apply these adjustments. So we're going to insert 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on. All right, so we start off with a 10, and we know the balance factor on that is zero. It's going to be perfectly balanced. We insert a 20, and that's still going to be balanced. We insert a 30. This has a balance factor of zero, negative one, negative two. That negative two tells us our tree is not balanced anymore. And there's four possibilities. Since the imbalance is negative, it's either the right left case or the right right case. Look at its child. Its child is negative one, and so this is the right right case. So this rotation is particularly easy in this instance because, right, this is node three, this is node four, this is node five. A is null, B is null, C and D are null. Right, there's no children under these nodes. So our rotation simply changes node 4 to be the root, brings node 3 down to the left, leaves node 5 on the right. So our right-right notation says this should turn into the following. That's just that transformation. Does that make sense? So let's keep going. Let's add a 40. So balance factors of 0, negative 1, uh, negative 1, and 0. So that's balanced. Let's add a 50. So now this is a balance factor of 0, negative 1, negative 2. Um, 1, 3, negative 2, and 0. All right, so we move up. This is the first node we find that has an undesired balance factor. And again, it's a negative 2 followed by a negative 1. So this is a right-right case. So let's, let's be a little more careful with this. So this is node 3. A is still null, this is node 4, B is null, this is node 5, C and D are null. So it's the same thing we just did before. We're going to change node 40 to be the root, 30 is going to come on the left, 50 is going to come on the right. So we're doing a rotation on this subtree. And this subtree, now 40 is going to be the root, and then 30 and then 50. I'm stopping drawing my circles because there's going to be too many circles. So that's a nicely balanced tree. So let me redraw that. And let's insert a 60. And this is, I'm pretty sure this is going to be unbalanced. So balance factor 0, negative 1, 1, 2, this is also negative 1, this is 0, this is 0, but this is 1, this is 1, 2, 3. The root of the tree has a balance factor of minus 2. Okay, and so it's still a minus 2, minus 1. This is another right, right case. <coughs> But in this case, we've got some other nodes here to worry about. This subtree A is this tree containing a 5. 
Subtree B is this node containing a 30. C and D are null. Sorry, C is null, D is this, this 60. So let me label these. So this is node 3. This is A. This is node 4. This is B. This is node 5. This is subtree D. These really dark ones are D. And C is null. Because there's no left child in node 5. And so our balancing algorithm says make node 4 the root. Bring node 3 down as a left child. Leave 10 on the left of, of 20. But take... Um, Take node B and let 20 adopt that on the right. Okay, this is still the sense of rotating about the 40, basically taking this and just bringing it down. So the 20 is going to come down on the left of 40. 10 is going to stay right where it is relative to 20. But then this node 20 is going to have an open space on the right that's going to adopt subtree B, which is the 30. So how's this going to look? We're going to take node 4 and make that the root. So there's our 40. Its left child is going to be node 3, which is a 20. 20's left subtree is going to be unchanged. That's still going to be a 10. 20's right subtree is going to be subtree B. So that's going to be 30. 40's right subtree is going to be node 5, that's our 50. 50's left child is going to be unchanged, that's still null. 50's right child is going to be unchanged, that's the 60. And that's beautifully balanced. All right, is this making any sense at all? So you can, you can prove that these things restore balance and that they preserve the search order and all that kind of stuff. We're not going to do that. We're going to trust Wikipedia. So let's do one of these harder cases where we have to do two rotations. And let's see if I can force that. I think if I put in a 55, that may happen. So let's insert a 55. So we've got 40, 50, 60, 55, 20, 10, 30. And let's find balance factors. So this is 0. What's the balance factor of the node 60? one because this has height zero and null has height minus one so zero minus minus one what's the balance factor of the 50 almost negative two Left subtree is null, that's minus 1. Right subtree is this, that has a height of 1. Minus 1, minus 1, minus 2. And I'm cheating when I do these. I'm just kind of looking and saying there's nothing on the left, there's two things on the right. So 0, minus 2. All right, I'll do these for you because these are very complex. What about the 40? Negative 2. Almost. Colder, colder, <laughs> warmer. So we're looking at the node 40. What's the height of this tree over here? The 
height is one. Maximum distance from the root to any node is one. And what's the height of this tree? So maximum number of hops from the root to any node is one, two. So one minus two, negative one, I heard it. I'll take it. And like I say, you can kind of cheat, right? This is the height of the left subtree. This is the height of the right subtree. This one's <coughs> one bigger, right? The one on the left is one shorter, so the balance factor is minus one. But the nulls and the single nodes get trippy. But we don't have to actually figure out that one because as soon as we find the minus two coming up from the node we inserted, we can stop. Okay, we know right here there's an imbalance. And the imbalance is minus two, and its child has a balance factor of one. This is a right-left case. So we have to do a pair of rotations. We have to do one rotation that brings it into a right-right case, and then we'll have to do another rotation. So let's, let's um, label these things accordingly. So this is node three. Sorry. Wrong spot, we're looking right here. So this is node three. A is null. This is node five. This is node four. And A, B, C, and D are all null in this case, right? A is the left child of node three, that's null. D is the right child of node five, that's null, and B and C are the children of node four, those are null. So this is a pretty straightforward rotation. Um, basically take node four, uh, swap it with five, put five on the right, leave three the same. And we're only working with this piece of our tree right here. So node three is gonna stay right where it is, but nodes four and five are gonna swap and five is gonna go on the right of four. So node four is gonna come up to be the child of node three and node five will go on the right. And the rest of the tree is gonna stay exactly the same. Still a binary search tree, we got 40, 50, 55, 60. It's nicely ordered. And balance factors now will be zero, minus one, minus two. And minus two with a minus one, that's our right, right case. And again, A is null, B is null, C and D are null. So how do we go from right, right to balanced? We take node four. So let me label these again. This is node three. This is node four. This is node five. Make four the root, put three on the left, put five on the right. So 55 becomes the root. 50 goes on the left. 60 goes on the right. Everything else stays the same. And that's perfectly balanced. It's actually a nice complete tree. So is the process making enough sense that you think you can do some of these on the board tomorrow? I'll, I'll hand out some post-Valentine's balance sheets. Um, and we'll just start inserting things into a tree and in groups you can work on doing these kinds of things. Um, and it's, it's very mechanical, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't really take a whole lot of thought. It takes no creative thought. It's, it's starting from the node you insert, working up to the root, calculating the balance factor, right? So you get some practice on that. And then when you find a two or a minus two, look at the child, see which of these four cases you're in. 
And then you just have to identify, right, this node's left subtree is called A, this node is called 3, this is called 5, its right subtree is called D, and you just make some rearrangements, right? We change the root to have 4 on the right instead of 5, and, and 4's left child remains B, and so on. Right, it's a very mechanical kind of process, which is good because it means it's really easy to write code to do this. Okay, so we'll play around with this tomorrow on the board, um, doing these, these rotations, and then we'll talk about how we actually could code this up. All right, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>